For years, Silicon Valley has been under fire for its lack of diversity, but some black female entrepreneurs are working to change the racial and gender landscape. In San Francisco, 76% of senior officer positions are held by a white person compared to less than 1% of black people who hold the same title. Black women specifically face higher rates of discrimination and are poorly represented in the workforce. Joining us now is one woman who is helping to turn those numbers around, Promise co-founder and CEO Phaedra Ellis Lemkins. Thanks for joining us, Phaedra. Um, so first off, tell us about what Promise is and a little bit about the experiences, you know, what you experienced trying to establish your business, what sort of obstacles you faced. Yeah, thanks for having us. So Promise is a technology company that's an alternative to incarceration. So we work with governments. Instead of keeping people who can't afford bail in jail, we use technology to monitor and support them outside of incarceration. And the goal is to get people home as quickly as possible, help get them back to work, and have counties not paying money to keep people in jail who are just because they're poor, black, or brown. And go ahead, please. No, no, continue, Phaedra. Sorry. No, that's okay. And um, and so we've raised about uh, $12 million. And what that allows us to do is to partner with governments and to be able to think about how to grow as quickly as possible. And I feel really lucky because we've had incredible investors from traditional venture capitalists to Jay-Z and Rock Nation. And so we've kind of met this moment of opportunity where technology can actually help solve some problems, I think, for a lot of people in our communities. So. There are two narratives generally in the media, right? Uh, and this is generalizing, but there's one narrative that says, look, young people, young kids in urban communities uh, in Africa, I've done stories like that, where we're teaching young women how to code. There, you've seen those stories repeatedly in the media, young women coding, young women of color coding, young women in impoverished countries learning to code because that is the future of, of the, basically the, the, the industries that are most prominent uh, in this country and in others that are um, tech savvy. But women of color are leaving tech companies at higher rates. So explain for us and to our audience your trajectory, like where you started and how you, the obstacles that you face, as Anne-Marie pointed out. But more importantly, explain then why get to this point and then leave. Um, yes. So for me, I have a probably very different trajectory, which is I started out in the labor movement, social justice, politics, and then I worked in music, and then I went to technology because I wanted to better understand scale because I understood technology I thought was negatively impacting um, music and also the labor movement and working people. And so I really went, because I couldn't afford to go to business school, so I was like, oh, I'm gonna go work at a tech company. And I ended up running revenue and operations, and I, and I started to understand that all of the work I'd done before actually wasn't gonna be effective um, because I couldn't scale. We could only help a certain number of people or I didn't understand how to break down problems. And the way that I think about technology is, it's something that if you do over and over again, technology can replace. And so I wanted to understand that. And I think people leave because I, I have to say as a woman of color, uh, it's been one of the most difficult environments I've been in. And when you look at it, like the Cape Force Center did a study that said um, over 40% of people that are left their jobs in tech left it because they'd faced discrimination. And almost two thirds would have stayed if someone would have um, thought about workplace culture. And I think a lot of that is because tech basically is pattern recognition. And so it mostly recognizes folks who go to an Ivy League school, networks of people that know each other. And that's just difficult because as someone who went to a state school as a woman of color, you just don't have the same experiences. You don't have the same networks. And so you're in a place that often feels isolating and doesn't recognize who you are. And those networks are pathways to the money. I mean, you need people that are willing to invest in you to, to get these startups going. And, and it appears to me that that has been a huge challenge for minorities, but, for, you know, obviously for, for African-American women as well. But things are changing with some people. You were able to get the funding that you needed. How are some women overcoming this challenge? Yeah, well, I think, I think it's important to note that that there are those of us, I think, who've been able to raise capital, but I think it's still incredibly hard. Like, I was lucky because I ran a sales team, and so people knew that I could um, raise money, I could run a team and effectively make money, and I came from a startup that had been successful, right? And so I was able to, people were able to say, oh, okay, you have experience, you get it, you know what to do. And I think even that, like, I happened to know so-and-so, I ended up in the right position, and then I did well. But I think most people 
might not have a network to be able to connect them to that type of opportunity. And so I think that, yeah, I think I've done well, but I don't think it's that I'm a, a, um, the only human who has the capacity to do well. And I think part of my job as a woman of color is to create more opportunities for people to shine because you referenced coding in Africa, you reference coding in communities of color. And I think our job is to recognize everything from people who are effective hustlers, can be salespeople, to people who've gone to schools that aren't Ivy League schools, to HBCUs, and to create opportunities for those people. And I feel like that's my privilege and opportunity to do, because certainly it isn't just smart people go to Ivy League schools. It isn't just people that we already know that have the example to shine and the ability. And so we have to create opportunity for people who um, come from places that don't always get recognized. You know, I think one of the thing about Silicon Valley and a lot of these um, companies is, you know, I, I think of Facebook and sort of ideal um, culture that they try to promote and, you know, that we're all about creativity and we're welcoming and blah, 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 blah. But this conversation about a lack of diversity we've been having for a few years now, um, I'm wondering, you know, clearly the decision makers, it seems like they are not aware of the negative impact of not having a diverse work environment. What are they missing out on that they just don't get? Well, I think when I went to work at my last company, um, one of the investors told the then CEO that it was most likely that I wouldn't work out, right? Wow. And, and then I ended up succeeding. But I think that if you're walking into that type of environment, then you it's, it's a challenge to be successful. And I think what's hard for these companies is that they don't recognize that diverse opinions actually make you stronger. And what's um, even I think more sometimes offensive is the fact that they depend on users of color to actually make their products, I think, thrive. And so it's up to people to make the case. Like our company has to succeed. Promise has to win because I'm clear that we have to be able to show not just that women of color can lead, but that diverse companies who, who recognize and represent the problems, I think, of real people. Because the challenge is not just the recognition that, that diverse folks um, can be effective, but also that technology is not sometimes solving problems that are critical for diverse people, for working people, for people of color. The fact that, that um, technology funded a valet service for people for parking or dog walking, and not that those aren't all critical, but I think about all of the issues for us in criminal justice. I think for other people in daycare and taking care of their kids, it's like, what are the problems that real people are facing? And I think if we don't have diverse opinions, technology will not be an effective force for good in our society. And so it is not just the success of a company, but it's what role will technology play in our society. And if we don't have people who look like me, if we don't have people who are trying to figure out how to make their paychecks every week and what rent costs, then technology cannot be a stabilizing force in this society. Yeah, really, really well put, Phaedra. Well, hopefully uh, we're seeing a few people like you. Hopefully we'll see a few more and we'll continue to grow in this area for Silicon Valley. Phaedra Ellis-Lampkins, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.